Thank you and welcome to everyone. It's so good to see you here, those of you who are in the room and those of you watching later. It's a pleasure to have you here. So we're here today for creating and tailoring an effective resume. And this is session two of five of career management sessions for Linguistics Career Launch 2024. And I am Alex Johnston. I'm a faculty instructor an associate professor of the practice at Georgetown University. And part of my job there is to do career management for our department. I teach a class on career management for linguists for the past six years. That's a three credit semester long course that we offer to graduate students and now undergraduate students at Georgetown. And it's a really incredible opportunity to engage in professional development of the kind that we're doing together right now. I love teaching this course. I am passionate about this course. It's the course I would have wanted as an undergraduate when I was just making my way and learning what a resume is. And in addition to that work I do within academia, I've also developed and maintained a consulting practice for the past 15 years in which I deliver professional development training to corporate, government, nonprofit, and higher education clients. So as part of that, I deliver training, but I also work on resumes. I help people with their professional presence and the genres of job seeking, like creating resumes, cover letters, LinkedIn profiles, things that we'll be doing throughout our time together. So over the course of those years, I've seen hundreds of resumes from different sectors, and we'll be able to delve into some key aspects of what makes an effective resume for you and how you can improve and tailor your, re your resumes. For today, we'll start out as always with defining these genres. We have to know what genres we're working with here. We're also going to cover what counts as experience for your resume. You have more than you think. We're going to talk about an activity you can do on your own time or in your course with Dr. Anna Marie Truster. We'll talk about what is an everything resume and why you should have one. And then we'll talk about your tailored resumes. Uh, yes, plural, the ones that you use to actually apply to a job. We'll cover language for writing effective bullet points and then how to use the job announcements for those jobs you're interested in to tailor your resume and make it even more effective. So we have to just start out with what's a CV. So we're all on the same page here. And in the US, when I hear CV, I think academic CV. And this is basically a list of everything that a person has accomplished in academia. And I'm gonna go through some of the sections in the general order that you might see them on an academic CV. So you, you may look at CVs that start out with educational degrees, then go into research. That includes publications and conference presentations with all the information listed out of those presentations and dates of publication, dates, whether they were refereed or invited. Grants and awards, very important in academia with all of the details involved in those grants and awards, granting agency numbers, amounts. Then we get into teaching. This is what faculty members have taught over time. And this becomes a long running list the longer you're in academia. Service refers to administrative tasks and organizational tasks that are essential to running aspects of your department, of your college, your school, your university, and also aspects of the field, ways that you contribute to your field. Faculty mem members also have mentoring sec sections on their CV where they talk about the dissertations and thesis committees that they have been on and their role within those committees. Now, I wanna point out what I think is a great example of an academic resume of, this is the CV of my pro colleague, Professor Jennifer Neese. And if you look at this, you'll see these sections listed out. And I personally, really like this format with the sections listed on the sides. Hope you're seeing the CV right here that I'm showing on the screen. And you'll note that it just goes on and on 
listing types of publications, very detailed list and long lists, proceedings, corpora, presentations. We're not trying to read this right now. We're just looking at sections of it. Then we get into invited conference presentations and other, and it keeps going on for, for 13 pages. So I want you to take a look at that type of CV. You can use it as a model if you like. In fact, I used it as a model for my own academic CV because I will I'll, uh, share with you a, uh, a little secret. And that is that I did not have an academic CV until just last year. I was forced to make one so that I could apply for, for something academic. But it's so that shows just how long somebody can get by without an academic CV. I'm not a good model for that, but when I started to create it, I looked at the best models I could find. Other conventions of this genre, you'll find that it is in reverse chronological order, that it does not list other professional employment. So if you've held positions in administrative roles in a company or in an organization, may not be listed. If you've worked at the NSF as a reviewer or a section director, that is academia adjacent and it's part of service and, and that can be a very good thing to list on your academic CV, but typically you won't find any other jobs if the person has had them listed on the CV. And this experience just remains in the same frame. So it's tailored towards a higher education audience and their expectations of what's important to and constitutive of the core work of a faculty member. Length is fine and good. It can go up to 50 pages or 100 pages for some senior academics. It just keeps growing. Now, what genre should you use in an application? Sometimes there are questions about this, so I'll address this here right now. Academic CVs, they're for academic positions, like faculty in higher education. But if a job ad for a position outside of higher education asks for a CV, ask yourself, do they mean a resume? And then kind of delve into that. Where is that organization geographically located? In the UK, the term CV is often used to mean what people in the US refer to as a resume or a professional resume. Is the position academia adjacent? So that is, is the role in an organization that has a research position, a grant writing position? Is it a think tank? These are examples of places that might want the genre to gear more towards an academic CV. But you can always try to communicate with the hiring manager, the recruiter, or other bridge person a bridge person, meaning somebody who let you know about the opportunity or maybe a member of that organization and clarify that expected genre format. So then what's a resume? And frankly, I used to not love writing them, but now I realize just how much we can deploy our own linguistic skills of analysis in writing them. So come along with me as we talk about that. I'm going to focus on general business format for resumes. So for those, we're tending to talk about one or two pages. The exception here is for a federal resume that you would submit to a position in the US government. I am not talking today about federal resumes. They have their own format. Like an academic CV, they can be incredibly lengthy and they have specific genre expectations like month and year for every position, hours spent per month in position, things like that that are different from the generic general business format. And I don't cover them because there is so much publicly available information about federal resumes. So any .gov website that is hiring for a position the ads you find on usajobs.gov, which is where you would look for jobs in the US government, those will have specific instructions, if not templates, if not links to how to write your federal resume. In your resume, you're going to put your bullet points in an action and result format that describe your deliverables, stuff you did, stuff you produced, 
and describe the impact for each experience that you choose to put on your resume. And we'll talk about what experience means. It may or may not align with an actual hired position in an organization. Each bullet will start with an action verb. And I've included a link to a resource here, which I really like because it lists all the action words you could ever want in a taxonomy. We're gonna learn later about how to taxonomy with Anthony Koff. And the taxonomy of these action verbs is very helpful. So it gives you action verbs to use if you have managed people or action verbs if you've improved a process or verbs if you have you know, created a, a new, created a new process. So that's what's really helpful about this particular list. And you can keep that as a resource for when you're seeking these words to use in your, your resume. We don't use pronouns. We don't use first person or third person. And your results are quantified as much as possible to show the impact of your actions. Like academic CVs, they're typically in reverse chronological order. You may run into something called a skills-based format. This is less common. And I would say if you're starting with your first professional resume, you may not want to use this format. This is typically for people who are, who have eclectic varieties of experiences or a number of different positions and experiences that could fall or be grouped under specific skills like leadership or like uh, management or communication. In that case, it would be something that would be very aligned with a job announcement that is looking for leadership in X. And it might perhaps be useful then, but for a first resume or your first iterations of a resume in your earlier ages and stages of your career, I would recommend the, the typical reverse chronological order. And we want the formatting to be easy to read by humans and easy to scan by computers because we want to satisfy the robots. We'll get into a bit more of that later. Now, the two main purposes of a resume, get a job, right? Well, one of the main purposes of a resume is actually to get you an interview. It's just to get you through the first gate. It is to advance you past first round screening, advance you past any humans who are doing first round screening of all of those resumes. And people do do this, especially at smaller organizations, or you want that resume to get past what's called an applicant tracking system. That's just the computer that is used to scan your resume and likely compare it to the job announcement and to see what degree of match there is between the types of keywords that are used in the job announcement and the types of words you use on your resume. So it's scanning for specific language to see if you hit some of those qualifications or preferred qualifications. And you wanna get past that computer so that you can advance to talking with a human at some point. That's our goal because we wanna then, you know, use our skills in job interviewing. And the second purpose of a resume is to showcase your curated experience and accomplishments tailored to a specific job. So we'll talk about tailoring later on in this presentation, and I hope you have lots of questions about that. So all it needs to do, first job, is get you to that interview. Resume sections I've listed out here, and you can see already some of them may or may not differ from the academic CV. There is name and contact information. There is sometimes a profile section listed up at the top. This is optional. The profile section is two or three sentences defining yourself and your experience related to the job to which you're applying. So experienced academic professional seeking job in edu educational technology, leveraging skills with educational technology tools and 
generative AI to advance learner outcomes. That might be a way to cue that a person who is a, a teacher in an institution of higher learning is transitioning into educational technology. So it can serve to tell that quick story about how your background experience provides a, a bridge to a new transitional job, how you can transition from that experience to a new area of work. And then of course we have sections that are devoted to experience and there are all kinds of labels or titles you could use to define this experience. Some people call it work experience or professional experience, or you might label the experience specific to the job announcement. So it might be educational technology experience. If you want to pull out aspects of your own experience that can fall under that title might be grant writing experience, if that is core to the position you're applying to as a grant writer in a nonprofit organization. You may want to group leadership experiences under a, a experience category, if you want to show that you have managed people before and that you have driven projects to completion. Now, can unpaid or part-time work go here? Yeah. Yeah, that's useful. It's, it, you have deliverables and outcomes and impact through a variety of experiences, and it can be unpaid, it can be part-time. Now, your education, this may float in your professional resume. It may come first. It may come after the experience. So this may, be, may depend on your age and stage. Again, if you are just coming out of an undergraduate degree program, you may want to list your education first if you haven't had held a lot of positions, a lot of done a lot of work with a variety of organizations. It so this may depend. This is something that we can discuss later, and I'll have an example of a, a resume that shows where one person listed education. Grants and awards, mm, maybe if it's germane to the job announcement. So that's something that you have to, to judge. Volunteer experience, community outreach or engagement. These are examples of sections you could label if they're very important, if they show advocacy. So you might have that listed on a resume. And then there's a skills section that's typically near the bottom of resumes that that I review. And those could include language skills or technical skills of all types. You might put your, your programming expertise there and you might put experience with different software that might be useful for the job you're applying for. Interests, a lot of people ask me, can I put down my interest in deep sea fishing or you know, parachute, parachuting, hang gliding? Yeah, this is this is something to to check with people in the field uh, of the job that you're applying for. This this might create a co-membership link with a human interviewer at some point, but it's it's not a required part of your of your resume. So this is an area where you can you know not not spend a lot of energy. Now I have included a sample resume for you to review and link out to, and perhaps we can go back after the main content of this presentation and look at that. But this is a, a resume that is, that's been provided graciously by a doctoral student in the middle of their coursework, nearing the end of coursework. And I've de-identified it and anonymized it. It was originally developed as a kind of general all-purpose resume, more of a comprehensive resume. I took out several items just for presentation purposes. Uh, we have a quick question from the chat. How is volunteer work different from unpaid work? Volunteer work you might think of as something that you do for an organization. Perhaps you volunteer for the Humane Society, or you volunteer for an international educational exchange program like Global Ties or Fulbright Association, 
when I, so that's when you are in a volunteer position with an organization and they're accepting your work for free. When I think of unpaid work, I'm imagining all the unpaid work that we do in higher education that can be pulled out as experience. So for example, graduate students and undergraduate students are often asked to volunteer to organize conferences in university settings. And that's unpaid work, right? And that's something that you could actually pull out as you know, event organization experience and talk about your role in doing that, whether you engaged in the social media strategy for advertising the conference, whether you helped with you know, delivering materials to the, the conference attendees, creating those materials, that's the type of unpaid work that's in the back of my mind that could, that's not necessarily part of a position or part of an organization as its, its own entity. But that's something to think about as you look back on what you've done for different organizations and don't discount work or labor that's been unpaid or unrewarded because that has all often taught you many skills and you've often delivered something as a result of that work. And there's one other question about publications and whether that gets a section on your resume or not. Right, do we include a publications section on the resume? That was a, a significant absence from the resume sections that I posted because in general, no. I have not used publications. I've not listed out publications in my resumes that I've used to get jobs in industry. And that may seem really, really sad to all of us in academia who know that publications are just, you know, the gold standard and it's what we strive for. We want to publish. What I might do with respect to publications is judge how much writing or publishing of any sort is relative, relevant to the position you're applying for. So if you are applying for a position in a think tank, writing and publishing a structured research article on an issue is likely relevant. It shows that you ha have been peer reviewed. It shows that you have done an end-to-end -end research project and, and delivered results but you may not need to list it out in the typical fashion that you would on a CV. You might consider consolidating some of those articles saying published you know, X number of articles in the domains of you know, immigration policy you know, between these dates or in journals such as. So it's something that you might want to consolidate into a single bullet point in terms of quantifying it, talking about the, the topic, where they were published, rather than listing them all out in a large section. But again, you need to judge if that's going to be very useful for the position you're applying for. So in a position that I applied for in international educational exchange as a, as a director of uh, alumni relations, that wasn't necessarily germane. I was I had to present a writing sample, but I used a more general writing sample rather than an academic one. So that's a great topic for continued discussion. We can also find out from our, our audience here how people have managed that in the past. So I welcome you know those of you who have resume language and the experienced people who've translated their, their CV experiences into resume bullet points, feel free to post in the chat and get that discussion going because we can really make use of our distributed knowledge here. And then there's one other question um, before we move on, uh, which is just about um, application tracking systems um, may not be able to process the length of resumes, or at least some ATSs may not be able to. So some people have received uh, advice that, or have received feedback from other like resume workshops that having a resume of more than two pages isn't a problem because these uh, systems can't process the, the length of the document. What is your take on this? 
Yes, I see your question and thank you for, for reading that out. So there are various types of applicant tracking systems, which again, just refer to the computers and this type of software that's used to scan incoming resumes to make that first call, that first cut of which resumes are advanced on to another reviewer. And the problem is we don't know what type of applicant tracking system is going to be used. So there are some that can scan and understand PDFs and images and others that cannot. I have never heard of an applicant tracking system that kind of cuts off for length. There are, so the length with respect to, you know, uploading it into a computer is, is not as important as considering the formatting that you're using. And I'll, I'll have some tips on formatting to, you know, hack the ATS systems in a later slide, but as long as you're generally keeping to what is suggested by the job announcement, which might have a guide, and you're keeping it to one or two pages, which is typical business resume length, you should be okay. You're also organizing by order of priority and importance. So you're putting your experience and your education and just relevant work and skills up top. So if you choose to tack on you know, a third page that includes extended lists of publications or presentation titles. If that isn't seen or reviewed or scanned, it may not be as important. If it is germane to the job announcement, move that up or condense it into a bullet point or two. But we never know what, what ATS is going to be used there, and there are a lot of different types. Great. Perfect, we're getting information from Dr. Trester. This is just right on the version of the resume that she uses. I mentioned, I, Dr. Trester mentioned, I have authored two books in my summary. Beautiful. And that may crush the heart of some academics among us when we think of how that's valued and viewed in an academic environment, but it's, it's viewed differently and it is presented differently in this different genre format. Okay, so this sample resume link, I'm just going to point out very quickly some aspects of it before we do go on because I think it can be instructive. So I've highlighted in, in red some things to pay attention to. So we don't necessarily have to use our physical addresses, you know, with our street number and street name. A lot of people tend to use the general geographical area like Washington DC metro area. Try to use a personal or that is a non-institutional email that you use just for job applications and make it a professional one using your name instead of, well, things other than your name. And when we get down to aspects of experience in teaching, you can see that this person mentioned that they taught an undergraduate course and they mentioned the name, but one good thing is that they didn't include extraneous information that's not meaningful outside of the institution, the course number. We don't need to see course numbers. In addition, if you work for specific faculty members on research projects, you don't need to mention the faculty member's name because outside of academia, that name may not necessarily have recognition. When it comes to holding office hours, we can think about ways to describe that differently. I throw that out into the chat. The original language here was held office hours. It could be something, depending on what you're applying to, delivered supplementary training meetings, delivered supplementary training. Think about other ways that that could be described using language outside of the academy. Developed budget for grants and funds. Make sure you put in you know, the money amount, what you are responsible for. In general, this is a very clean, easy to read, easy to scan resume. And you'll note, even though this is a student who is co almost completing coursework, they have put their education below their work experience, which is a, a personal choice and it can be a very effective one. 
In addition, they make the fact that they have worked in many locations and in many types of work environments pop out by putting it on the right-hand side. So although I, I should have put location one, location two, but these are different countries, these are different cities, and it also shows remote or you know, when the location is listed, that means in person. So this is a, a clean, easily scannable, easily readable type of sample resume format. Okay, here's how to hack it. The design and formatting for your resume. Try to keep it simple for that applicant tracking system. So you can read this particular article that I linked to about how to beat applicant tracking systems or just how to work around some of the commonly known weaknesses. And again, I haven't read or experienced tracking systems that cut off after a certain amount of pages, but really you're gonna be fine with one to three pages at the very most. So again, no fancy formatting, even those, those arrow bullet points can be misread by some systems. Don't use graphics not necessary and it's often misread. It comes out as, as different characters. On US resumes, it's not part of the genre format to include a photo of yourself. So leave off photos. Be aware that the two column format, which a lot of people are attracted to as resume creators can be unreadable by an ATS. When that software is searching for information to put in different boxes on, on the back end, it might misread your name as your location or your experience as your location. It's difficult for some of these systems to read columns and they tend to you know, scan across. So if you want to use a two column format, try to use that for a human if you dare, I say that facetiously. It's a format that has a lot of love and a lot of not love from different readers and different reviewers. So some reviewers, it makes them work harder to, to scan it as a human because they're expecting information kind of in that play script style, that top to bottom horizontal style. So it can, it can cause people to take more time to get through it. Speaking of human resume reviewers, how long does a typical first round resume reviewer look at your resume? And I'm gonna look in the chat for this. Do you think it's A, B, or C? Oh, Aaron, yeah, you know. <laughs> you all know this, you're right. You are right, less than 10 seconds. And that means that you want to keep it in a pretty readable format with your contact information at the top, with your experience at the top, with your skills later on. People who are human reviewing your resume know where to look and they tend to look in that top third for your experience and then tend to scan down, up and zero in on just different aspects in a very short period of time based on their own genre expectations. So, so you wanna take advantage actually of those genre expectations by not being too creative. This of course may depend on your sector. So if you're applying to graphic design jobs, you may be more creative with your resume format than you would for a business industry job, especially for a government job also. There's no formatting there. <laughs> so you wanna start building your resume with your experience and Begin with a self audit, really go back over your life and think, make sure you're not missing anything you did because this happens a lot, actually. We overlook a lot of our own experiences because we normalize a lot of our skills and accomplishments. Or maybe we did help a faculty member organize a conference and we thought, yeah, you know, I, I did that, but that's just something that, you know, my professor asked me to do and it was just another thing. Well, that actually shows that you engaged in event coordination and that you engaged in very time sensitive logistical arrangements. So it's, it's not 
that normal. Not everybody has that experience. So these, these experiences that we tend to take for granted because everybody around us in academia, say, is doing similar things, is not that normalized outside of academia. And there are ways to talk about those experiences in a translated version that will appeal to different employers for different positions. So you'll notice I'm, instead of saying conference organization, which is fine, you can say something like event coordination or event management. And we also tend to you know, overgeneralize the skills and the accomplishments. We kind of think if we're in graduate school, well, everybody around me has good research, writing and presentation skills. Like all of us, that's, that's what we're all doing every day. But outside of academia, this is not the case. Your written and oral communication skills are are highly evolved and trained and honed at this point, having worked through different academic genres of oral and written expression. You have a, a lot to focus on when it comes to your communication and your presentation skills. So again, you have more than you realize. It doesn't have to be paid. So we talked about unpaid work. It doesn't have to be full-time either. So consider those part-time experiences and, and don't be concerned that they were only part-time. They're still experience, especially if you produced something, if you delivered something in that role. And you can even have engaged in independent projects that count as experience. So have you taken a coding class and gained a certification? Did you build your own website for yourself or for a, a small business that you were asked to do in, as a volunteer or as an unpaid you know, family member or friend? Did you create uh, an app or design a conversational flow for a chatbot just to teach yourself how to do it? Is there any kind of self-education that you engaged in that resulted in a significant development of a skill? That's something that can be put on a resume, definitely on your big, expanded, comprehensive resume. And yeah, your academic training absolutely counts. Major class projects that you've completed, a term project, your research experiences with a faculty advisor or a team or a colleague, doing your thesis or dissertation project. We would talk about it in a different way, but that kind of end-to-end -end research design and production of a deliverable in the form of, you know, kind of a, a big paper and a number of presentations, that's, that's very salient for a number of positions. Your work as a teaching assistant or a research assistant, designing course curriculum, lectures, media, this can be very useful if you're applying to a job in curriculum design, instructional design, or educational technology. And then those extracurricular or volunteer activi activities, yes they can count. You would want to make note of them in your big comprehensive resume. So were you part of a club or an affinity group, part of an athletic team? Did you engage in leadership of any of those groups? Did you manage a budget? Did you raise funding? Employers love that <laughs> when you can bring in funding and you can manage money. So consider going over your experience and just looking for all of those projects you might have, have overlooked in the past. And I recommend on your own time to try doing this activity that is adapted from Dr. Anna Marie Truster's book, Bringing Linguistics to Work. Set a timer, five, 10 minutes, write down all the jobs that you've ever had. And when I say job, I mean your experience. So think again of these projects that you've completed or the conference that you organized, or the, the tutoring sessions that you did at the local library. Think of all of those. And then to engage in more career discernment, think about the best thing and the worst thing of each one of those jobs. So you might come up with something like this. Maybe you were engaged in babysitting or nannying, and the best thing was making up those activities and bonding with the children. And the worst thing was behavior management, dealing with tantrums. Maybe you skipping down TA'd an undergraduate linguistics class, and you loved creating your lesson plans and lectures, 
but the worst thing was the grading. So that can tell you something that can tell you, you know, you like aspects of teaching. So you like that creation and that presentation and you like those aha moments, but the assessment parts are what you tend not to gravitate towards. So make this kind of list to start drawing from. And that is going to be the basis of your everything resume. And I've used this up until now and called it other things. Some people call it a comprehensive resume. I have a student who calls it her big boy resume. It's really going to be this, this long unedited list of experiences and bullet points to describe your past deliverables and accomplishments as a record for yourself, as a reminder for yourself of all the details that you will likely forget in just a year or five years. So start out with this because this is gonna be what you draw from to tailor your subsequent resumes you submit to jobs. Every job you'll apply to is going to be to have a tailored resume that is based on the job announcement. Yes, every job. And no, I'm serious. I had a student who was in a master's program studying computational linguistics and so much technical expertise, so much training, and they were looking for an internship and they were sending their resume out for every internship they could find from big tech companies like the big five to any number of startups. And they came to me for advice and they said, I've sent out 110 resumes and I've only been asked for, for one HR screening interview and that didn't work out. You know, what's, what's wrong? And I said, well, you know, can you show me some of the, the job announcements and show me your resume and let's compare them. And they were like, why? And I said, you, you need to adapt your resume to these positions. So if you have a position that mentions deep learning and you don't mention your own experience with deep learning on your resume, you know, the computer, the applicant tracking system isn't gonna make that match. That's a failed match. You know, you have to, you have to look at the announcement you have to take words that are important for this in that announcement and use them in your own resume. So I could see that this person had all of the qualifications for so many of these internships and contract positions, and yet they weren't using the same words as in the job announcement. And they said, <laughs> no way am I going to do that. That takes way too much time. I said, well, you know, what's happening right now? You've sent these out, sent these resumes out in this scattershot approach using the same document and nothing is being returned to you. That's your answer from the marketplace. So the time that you invest in tailoring the resume is going to pay off later. You might actually submit fewer resumes and get more response, maybe, if you work on tailoring. I mean, it's still a numbers game. You still have to apply a lot and it's still gonna be this huge funnel of a lot of applications to a few HR screenings to a couple interviews to maybe one offer in a successful situation, but you have to increase your chances by using that job announcement as your source document and doing some linguistic analysis. And yes, I would say you do have to tailor your cover letter along with your resume. You might have some certain stories you keep and you use in your uh, cover letter that appear time and time again, but you'll slightly shift frame in order to highlight the skills and experience that will solve problems for that organization that has posted that job announcement. Let's talk about effective bullet point language. We're at that point. And here's where I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second. And at this point, I would say you can take a bit of a break if you need to stretch and we can all, I'll stay here and I'll answer some questions and then we'll continue with how to craft bullet points. So let's, let's talk together for just a bit.
Um, I have a couple of questions from the chat that we can start off with, if you'd like. Sure. Um, so some of them were about uh, formatting of resumes. One person likes to use like a table and put all put all the text in different sections of the table in order to keep things organized and compact. Is that an issue for applicant tracking systems? I would say that it it could depend on the system because some of these softwares are are looking for matches. They're looking how to fill out fields. Uh, that correspond to, you know, documentation on the other side that that organization is use, using. And it might even be using that to reformat your resume, to put it into a field of organization that will make sense for the human reviewers that will receive that information. If it is in a PDF form, there are some tracking systems that won't recognize it. They'll view it as, a, as an image only and not be able to pull out the text. I mean, some organizations still use these older forms. So if it's in a, in a document, a Word or Word doc or Google doc, um, it, may, it may work. But what I say is that if you have, I, I would recommend that the formatting is as simple as possible, that it's in plain text, it's in a plain Word document with not a lot of additional formatting because you want to have that version for, for uploading to systems. You'll want to have that version for when you submit an application that forces you to put everything into a text box <laughs> and text fields uh, and don't and doesn't allow you to upload anything. And it's just going to make it easier if you have it in plain text for you to quickly lift, copy and paste into a text field in the application. You can keep beautifully formatted fancily formatted resumes as hard copy resumes to give to people. And that can often be, you know, a great display copy that you might hand out to somebody if you have an informational interview that's in person, or if you know that you're going to have an in-person encounter, or if you go to a job fair, that's fine. But for the, these applicant tracking systems, I tend to be very conservative with formatting. And I worry about tables, any form of tables or charts or images or content like that. Um, related to that, if the application needs to include case studies with graphics, would it be better to have that like linked as a bullet point or something from your resume rather than on the resume itself? Right. This is getting into what I would call a digital portfolio question. You could have a website that displays case studies or your digital portfolio of any type. And by that, I mean lists of projects that you've engaged in that show in a very easy, easily readable, scannable way on a, on a website, what, you, what problems you've addressed, how you've addressed them, what deliverables you've had, what challenges you faced and what action steps you took, what you learned from it and what are steps forward. You can present those types of case studies or ways of discussing research projects of any sort that you've undertaken on a website and then use that link for putting into a bullet point, you know, so that you can link out to it and somebody who is reading it, if they're lucky enough to see it on a screen, they can quickly link out to it and read it. If they don't have that format, at least they will have the URL to, to look up. So that's a great option to have. People may or may not choose to look at it or, or to read it, but it's, it's a good way to encapsulate further information within your resume. Um, another question is about Trojans, which are like tiny white text, like keywords written in tiny white text that like people wouldn't see, but an ATS might see. Do those actually work or not? I would steer away from those. Don't use them. Go the honest route. You can do it you can use your skills of linguistic analysis to read that job application, uh, that job announcement, and you can pull out those skills and those keywords yourself. And that's gonna be a far better process for you in the long run, rather than attempting that kind of subterfuge. So what we really wanna do is build skills in extracting what is important from a job announcement and then deploying that in your genres of, jo of job seeking documents like resume cover letter and in your oral presentations of interviews and networking. 
So like, think about your skills lifelong and we're gonna build those. Okay, um, another major question is, uh, what are some terminology translations from academic to employment speak? Um, All right, that is predicting what we're gonna get into now. So I have examples okay. of that. Let's take this opportunity to get into some examples. Effective bullet point language. We are going to be displaying accomplishments and results. So our cat friend here on his cat resume tells us, you'll notice I have caught the red dot. This is a reference to how some cat owners or cat carers use laser pointers and cats love to chase after laser pointers. That red dot on the floor, they can never get their paws on. So that is an accomplishment. If that cat caught that red dot, Awesome. Your resume is not meant to be a list of your job responsibilities or tasks. So here's how a cat will create some bullet point fails. This is what I've seen uh, humans do in a number of situations. So dot catching, biscuit making, loafing. This is cat internet speak for all the things cats do. They make biscuits with their paws and they loaf around. That's their, that's their job, that's their responsibility or they might be tasked with catching red dots weekly, or they might be responsible for red dot catching. This is not what a prospective employer wants to read. They wanna see results. So let's turn these into wins. Caught 10 red dots per week in fiscal year 2023, developed dot catching process adopted company-wide, resulting in 75% Q4 increase. All right, so we're talking about cats here. We're gonna turn that into human language using some examples. First, when you're brainstorming a bullet point, I want you to think of problems and challenges you took action on that produce results because you're gonna show the impact of your results through quantification as much as possible. And you can use the star story structure to think through what you've accomplished. The star story is just a structure to develop a narrative in a very curated and edited form. And we're gonna concentrate on the action and results part of this structure that we can talk about more later. A situation is simply a problem that you faced the task is what you were tasked with doing or what your responsibilities or goals were. Action, what actions did you take to solve this problem or address the situation? Results, what was the outcome? How can you quantify it? Or how can you describe the impact or lasting effects? We're focusing here on bullet points in on these actions and results that you took. So here's an example. And then later we'll look from CV to resume, how we can translate. Situation, trainees at my organization weren't ready to navigate the organization's data tracking system by the end of the one week onboarding session. It was taking them two weeks. Ah, too much time. Task, my boss asked me to review the onboarding program and see what gaps there were in training to help trainees learn how to use the system faster. This is you brainstorming here, writing this down. This is not official bullet point yet. Now, what actions did you take? Created the company's first training manual, successfully persuaded management to adopt the manual, overhauled training curriculum built around manual use, and guidelines. Great. Let's go into the results. Don't forget those. Trainees learned the system in only one week. That was the target goal. That's awesome. And the manual was adopted company-wide and is still in use today. That shows lasting impact. So we're going to take the action and results from this star story, which is something that you could use in a job interview to describe a time when you had to create a new process or create buy-in for a new process. And that bullet might be something like develop the first training manual for X company's data tracking system, which cut employee onboarding time by 50%. Redesigned entire onboarding program, which was adopted company-wide and remains standard process today. And these achievements can be reframed 
to highlight different skills that are aligned with those sought in different job announcements. So you might slightly reframe or reword in order to focus on your communication, your persuasion, your leadership, how you influenced without authority, or how you did some instructional design. We're going to talk quickly about how we can make a bullet point go from a task or a responsibility to an accomplishment. Here's a task, not a result. What actions, these are questions you ask yourself, what actions did you take to organize these events? If you're responsible for organizing events and, act and panels, what actions did you take? Did you recruit speakers? Did you coordinate logistics of space, catering, or budget? Did you manage publicity, make media appearances, execute a social media plan? Tell us about the actions. And then those results, how many panels, over what time period, how many attendees? Did attendance increase? I hope so. Did attendees take action as a result of these panels? So let's change this and see what we can learn from this. Planned and delivered public discussion panels on timely topics, such as the Iowa caucuses for audiences of 500 plus US Fulbright alumni and international grantees on a bi-monthly basis for five years. There's some quantification in there about the number of attendees over time and the type of topics. Recruitment here, identified and recruited 30 plus state government officials and community organization leaders to participate as panelists. You can translate this into conference experience, right? If you've have a, had a conference organizational experience or you've worked on panels for, for other events. Created marketing materials and publicized events through social media, local TV and radio, delivered live and pre-recorded local news interviews on site and in studio. So the first bullet point is showing some organizational and logistical skills. The second is showing your research, your interpersonal communication skills, how to influence without authority. And the third is showing, we hope, strategic marketing and some media savvy. We can quantify this even more. So created marketing materials and publicized events through social media and local TV and radio represented the Fulbright chapter in local news appearances. How broad was the reach? Were new chapter members recruited? Did these events increase public awareness of the organization or the brand? Think about that and try to quantify it. So created marketing materials and publicized events through social media, increased follows by 30%, increased program attendance by 50% and doubled new memberships. That's quantification that gets attention. When you use statistics, be honest, a 50% increase from 40 to 60 attendees or 400 to 600 is accurate and significant. 50% increase from four to six, that's kind of misleading. I, I've seen people who have talked about, you know, um, developing, you know, an Instagram following and, and growing it, you know, 1100% in four weeks. It's like, of course, when you go from one to 1100, I mean, it just, it, it, it's just, uh, it's misleading to use statistics in that way. And if you can't try to figure out a quantification, talk about that lasting impact. Here we go translating. So on the right, this is a sample of someone's CV, their academic CV that I was given permission to use. And under teaching, you can see a number of positions listed in the academic CV style, just title and time and the type of responsibility that you had in that position. Now, I wanna show you how this PhD student who was in their final year, so dissertating and also applying for academic jobs, but really seeking a, a role in industry, rewrote their experience of being a teaching assistant for the linguistics teaching practicum. Course developer, linguistics teaching practicum. Bullet point, developed a new curricul curriculum for graduate students serving as teaching assistants for the first time. 
led weekly classes on problem solving strategies for real time issues, created a structure for the practicum that's been retained throughout subsequent semesters. So first I wanna point out course developer. This person isn't calling themselves a, a graduate instructor or instructor of record anymore. That's not going to translate to people in industry or it's not going to have as much impact. Course developer, we can understand outside the academic context. And it's also you know, a role that, that people can have. Developed a new curriculum led weekly classes. We're using these action words and we're showing innovation and we're showing how, how long this was lasting, weekly classes, and created a structure that has been retained throughout subsequent semesters. So it's been used over time. It had an impact at that university organization. Now there might be other ways that we could perhaps even improve on, on this or consider ways to adapt this language too. So we can see that curriculum, if that's used in the job announcement, by all means use curriculum. It's a common word in many sectors. Some organizations that are focused on HR, that advertise positions in HR might use terms like training and development cadence. So I've had to use that term before. Subsequent semesters, you might, you know, use through present rather than referring to a semester system, which is very academically based. So, and again, using something like spring 2019, use the, use the months um, that translates to a wider audience. Offer accepted as an analytical linguist at Grammarly. So this worked, this and the rest of the really excellent resume worked. Here's a way to polish administrative experience if you've had it. And a lot of us have had these uh, part-time jobs in organizations where we've had client-facing positions and, or we've worked in customer service of some sort. So I had one student who had an initial bullet point on a resume that was like this, office clerk, X clinic. So this was a medical practice where they worked as the front, the client-facing person, front-facing person. Bullet, prepare patient appointment billing sheets, lab forms, and procedure consent documents. So here's a list of tasks and responsibilities. This is how we tried to improve that. Administrative assistant, which was true, X clinic prepared 100, over 100 patient files for review weekly in high volume clinic environment, executed essential administrative and logistical support for two physicians, developed process improvements for office workflow, which led to higher patient satisfaction ratings, maintained patient and data confidentiality. So this is building out more through asking these questions of what was the impact? What was the reach? How, how many of these files did you have to pull and, and prepare for the physicians and then follow up with per week? How did you have to record things? What information did you have to guard? What policies and procedures did you follow? This is how you can draw out those accomplishments. Offer accepted here for an events coordinator in a nonprofit organization focused on K-12 education. Tailoring. This is the most important. I'm gonna give you an example of tailoring your experience to the job announcement. Imagine on your academic CV, you have this as an experience. You were instructor of record for let's say Spanish 101 in spring 2024. And your goal is to transition into industry and land a position in educational technology. Well, Duolingo is hiring today for a curriculum designer and polyglot. Oh, don't you love that they use polyglot properly? That just warms your heart. You know Duolingo is actually hiring linguists. It's an organization that builds off of linguistic ex expertise. So it's not a huge leap from academia, an academic environment into an industry organization like Duolingo in terms of the type of skills and expertise you can transfer there. So this is a link to the actual 
announcement, which is live now, that you can look at. And I'll show you how you can sort of translate that Spanish 101 experience into a potential bullet point. Using actual keywords. Designed language curricula and learning materials for 300 plus adult learners of Spanish. Assessed learning outcomes aligned with CEFR and ACTFL standards. Leveraged generative AI and educational technology tools for content creation. The words that are highlighted in green here are directly taken from the job announcement. That means that when Duolingo applies their applicant tracking system and it goes over your resume, it's going to pick out and find a direct match between that language and the job announcement. So you can go ahead and compare this to the job announcement. And of course, we are assuming that this is actually true experience, but it's likely true for someone who has taught Spanish in 2024, where we have to make use of, of AI tools and, and other kinds of educational technology. We want to keep everything real. I mean, I'm advocating for being authentic and being real. So these are just final tips and advice as we head into the home stretch and gear up for Q&A. Don't overstate or exaggerate. I mean, upon first read of a lot of resume language, it might seem kind of overblown. So you can imagine this kind of situation, screen grab from Twitter. How would you write, I changed a light bulb on your resume? Ah single-handedly manage the successful upgrade and deployment of a new environmental illumination system with zero cost overruns and zero safety incidents. Right, we don't wanna do that. We don't want to over-exaggerate our experience. Before you submit though, I want you to keep in mind a few things. Keep that one resume version with limited formatting at, for entering into text boxes when you have to, or for sending to an applicant tracking system when you have to. Save versions of your tailored resume as both a doc and a PDF, depending on the type of upload that's required or the type of reviewer you're going to have. The PDF preserves the formatting for the humans among us and the docs are easily scannable by the ATS, assuming there's limited formatting. Label those files you upload or send out to people as you know, name, resume, something informative and identifiable because far too often I have accepted and seen and experienced resume files that are labeled resume or resume draft version two, final, final, final. And that's just frustrating for the humans among us. And then again, get other eyes on your resume. This is key, key, key. These other eyes are part of your career community. You want to leverage that growing community and this growing network of, of wonderful people that you're meeting at LCL, in your institution and beyond. These are our people who are going to help us, who are going to be that extra person to read something and ask those, those leading questions about your accomplishments. They're going to be experts in the field. They're going to be people who will tell you exactly what keywords are important to the sector or the organization or the position type that you're interested in. You're gonna find out those keywords through informational interviewing. That's our next time together. We're going to talk about how to deploy informational interviewing and, and use it to find out those keywords in different industries that will make a difference on our resume should we adopt them and use them skillfully. We want to do careful, close reading, sounds like discourse analysis, of job announcements. Read them so carefully. Go through them highlighting the terms that stand out to you, the terms that are repeated, the terms that you don't know because you have to look them up, and terms that may seem normal but might be used in a different way from how you're used to them. So a typical example is, is uh, development. That's a word that's used in different sectors in very different ways if you are in, in computer science. A developer is somebody who codes and 
creates the code. If you are in development in a nonprofit organization, you are a fundraiser and you're cultivating potential donors to uh, donate to that organization. Deploy those linguistic skills of analysis. This is one of your superpowers that can be applied to your own job search. So use it, use your attention to different words, different word usage, salient words, salient silences, and analyze those. And then be explicit, ask people about it, ask people in the field through informational interviewing, through your growing network of contacts, ask, what does this mean? How can I use it? Why is this important? And then I'm leaving you with a few resources, some of the templates that are provided by the Career Center on my own home campus, but I do encourage you to look into the Career Centers on your institutional, in, associated with your institutions, or if you're an alum, you can go through their alumni career resources and find a lot of these genres, templates, advice, tips. You may wanna consider something like JobScan, which will serve as your own pet ATS that you deploy on your own resume. It's, you upload a resume that's tailored to a job announcement. You upload the job announcement. That job scan is going to find that degree of match of language. It might say 40%, it might say 80%. It's not judging your resume about necessarily how good it is, but it's going to give you a sense of if you're using enough keywords. And then you may wanna check out this quick video. Feel free to connect with me. I look forward to our discussion. It looks like there are a couple of questions on um, how much time should you be spending on uh, tailoring your resume and are there any tips to make that a more effective process? How long should you spend? Because I'm, I'm sure you're thinking of, you know, I, I might need to send out 50 resumes, 100 resumes. If, if you are applying to, to jobs in a similar sector or a specific type of role, say you're applying to a user experience researcher type of role, you may have one resume that will be tailored towards that job family. And that will be one that you might not need to tweak too much after you do some initial tailoring to that type of position. After you translate, say, you know, your your work in, um, like if you had a longitudinal research study, um, you might substitute the word <clears throat> diary study for, for something in user experience research. Find out how, what those words might be to do the kind of initial translation and adaptation. And then you can use that UX research resume to apply to a number of positions without a lot of change. So consider the type of job family first. And, you know, if you are then also applying to roles in educational technology that will, you may use the same types of experiences, but you may use, you substitute different, different terms. Second point is the more that you do it, the faster you'll get. You'll have a, a very good uh, sample tailored resume that you'll be able to, after, you know, engaging in this habit of looking for keywords in job announcements, you can more and more quickly go over your own resume and, and realize you just have to do a couple of tweaks. Maybe you have you pull in an, exper an experience from your comprehensive resume to add in uh, to bolster the narrative of having experience in educational technology. Maybe you leave that out when you're applying for a role in user experience research, who knows? But it gets faster, I promise you. But the time invested up front is going to pay off later. Will, I see your hand up, please unmute. Hi, just a quick question. Um, So you were going over the experience kind of section tab, um, whatever you want to call it, and you, you suggested sometimes including personal projects under that section. Um, I've seen tech resumes with kind of a project section. So how do you feel about that? Well, in a sense, it, it uh, what I've seen is that those can be very successful and I did have in mind those type of tech roles where showing the projects that you've engaged in as an individual or as a member of a team in an institutional setting 
is, is very useful. I think it's a great way to draw attention to your deliverables because you show the, you know, the tools that you use to accomplish this, this project and, and solve the problems that came up in while you were, you know, working through this problem and you show the outcomes. And sometimes you can also link out to your GitHub or another website that'll display those those projects in a, in a different kind of graphical design way. But I do like having a project section. I think it works for a number of roles and positions where we're showing experience with different topics, different tools, different skills can be meaningful. And I think it's helpful for people who are coming out of a degree program where they've worked on a number of projects for different classes to frame them that way. And it can also help if you've engaged in projects outside of classes, perhaps you, you undertook a project as part of a, a club, you know, like a, a coding club or a human language technology club where you did a project on your own and then you don't have to have a separate section for, you know, club activities or extracurriculars and then you list that deliverable. So that way you can put that deliverable in a section of projects and keep it as this uh, similar type of, of deliverable. Thank you. And this is also something to check with, with people in the field. You can ask when you do informational interviews, you know, do you, for people who are in these roles, do you like seeing resumes with a project section? Is that useful? Or do you just want to see my GitHub link? Ask a number of different people who have experience and expertise in that field because I'm just one person and I've seen a lot of these tech resumes and I've seen them be very successful, not only in tech, but in educational technology and other areas, but, but I'm just one. So you need to get a number of perspectives and when, you know, as much as possible, drill down to people who are closer to the organization or the sector of interest that you're, that you want to go into. Hi, Crystal, would you like to unmute? Yes. Hi, Alex. Thank you for uh, this great talk about, again. Um, I was wondering, so you had talked a little bit more about this before, but um, I'd love to hear you elaborate more on it um, in terms of when you're talking, quantifying the impact of, you know, uh, something that you've done. And in a lot of cases, in a lot of roles that you take on in university, sometimes things are very hard to quantify because you're at a, such a kind of low level. You might have delivered a report, but you and you've seen the report being used but you have no idea of its longer lasting import like importance so how do you um kind of talk about talk about its importance when your role doesn't allow you to quantify its relevance right your role might not allow you to see the big picture or to see the effects maybe you've moved on or maybe you know you're just not part of that implementation team so i've what I've done in the past has been to kind of interview some people, ask them when I've written, I, I did have a task once of having to write an onboarding manual for a position and to, you know, write the, the job announcement, write a lot of documentation for a role. And I, you know, moved on from that role and then later checked back in, you know, a couple of years later, like, you know, reconnecting, built, you know, keeping relationships active by, reaching back out to the person who had supervised me at the time and, you know, oh, I remember that time I created that onboarding manual and all that documentation. And very naturally, you know, my former supervisor said, right, we're still using that. That's, that helped us to onboard people so easily. And we've used it with X number of people over X years. So sometimes it helps to find out from people who were in positions of authority, how your work was used. And it can also serve as, you know, multifunctional purposes in terms of, you know, keeping a relationship active by kind of checking back in or um, you, and so sometimes that, that, that person in position of authority might have the, the kind of 360 view and know the impact in a way that you might not have access to unless you asked. Thank you. Thank you. We have a related question in the chat, um, specifically about how do you 
quantify your like work that you do with research skills. So this is for jobs that say research skills are required, but they're flexible about the domain expertise. Um, so how do you quantify your results with research? Great question. I love this. So try to think about the, the different methods and tools that you used in carrying out a project. So, and, and sometimes this, this seems kind of invisible or normal to you, but you really have to be explicit about all of the, the methods that you use. So uh, for perhaps in, you know, recruiting volunteers for a uh, sociolinguistics field methods kind of project where you had to use sociolinguistic interviews to surface, uh, you know, oral data um, that was meant to display a particular language variety. You might say that you, you know, used um, a semi-structured interview protocol um, to work with those participants. You might talk about X number of participants um, you might talk about, you know, if it's, if you're working with a number of um, participants or a corpora that was composed of transcripts, you know, you might refer to the number of words or the type of coding system that you used, whether you used MaxQDA or another qualitative research tool for coding. Um, so you can try to start naming those methods that you used and and make sure that you're specific about them. You know, if they say that they're looking for qualitative research methods, uh, name them, you know, talk about the ethnographic, ethnographic field work that you did over, you know, X period of time. Uh, so there are ways to quantify over time and over a number and over, you know, like rough quantities of data and you can pick and choose how you want to quantify your data, um, whether it's words or transcripts or people or oh, people or data. So, so that might be a way to, to get going on, you know, questions you can ask yourself when you're looking back over the projects that you've completed. Oh, and thank you for po pointing out in the chat, uh, I see someone has pointed out the importance of a portfolio for case studies for user experience roles. This is something that is often pointed to in job announcements when portfolios are, are wanted or required. And often there might even be a field in the application for those roles that would say portfolio link here, <laughs> which I've had happen to, to uh, doctoral students who are applying for roles in UX and they quickly had to put together a portfolio. So you can always do this in advance by creating a, a website for yourself that displays some of your projects. So at least you have that to work from. There is a question about um, using Canva, iClicker and um, other things like, and also teaching on Zoom uh, for uh, relevant, as relevant experience for ed tech. Is that something um, can you like cite those things as skills um, that you use for applying for a job in ed tech? I've seen people list those in their skills section. So, you know, for creating graphics of all sorts, Canva, InDesign, Adobe, um, and, and other types of, you know, like collaborative working tools that they use for, for interaction with students or teams you know, Google Suites or other other tools. Um, see what what's relevant in that job announcement, what they're listing as, you know, required or as preferred. Try to meet that if you can. And also don't undersell the skills that you have. Uh, so for example, in the, the um, resume sample that I linked to in a Google Doc, under the skills section, there was a basic Python. And this is a person who took a very basic Python course, kind of a Coursera slash LinkedIn module on, on Python. And, you know, these, it can be so hard to quantify or qualify your experience with a programming language, but often, you know, enough 
to reference that in a skills section, if you've at least had a sub substantive LinkedIn module on it, especially if you've had a class, you know, intro to natural language processing or something, it's hard to, you know, you can't learn all of Python. It's very, you know, project focused. You learn what you need to learn in order to accomplish the results you, you know, to accomplish results. So sometimes just you have enough experience if it's for a non-tech role to list, you know, basic Python or, or to list our studios as a software that you're, that you can deploy. Um, so try not to undersell those technical skills, but also, you know, I'm assuming that this would be applying for, you know, not a role as a developer where you would really need to, to show all of your projects and have um, advanced experience. And I see a question about how to craft a profile or summary section at the top of your resume. Are bullet points still advisable or something a little more texty, but without I pronouns better? And yeah, thank you. I think it doesn't need to be bullet points in that profile section that you have under your name and contact information should you include to should you choose to include that some people call these executive summaries or profile there's a number of names for them and I, I recommend that you read a lot of them from people who are in the fields that you're interested in to get a sense of how they talk about themselves and a you know brilliant way to uncover these profile sections are to look through LinkedIn and to use that as a kind of database of seeing other people's summaries. The resume profile is going to be a, a little texty, but it won't have those subject, first, first person subject, subject pronouns. You sneak peek, that's interesting. <laughs> um, it's going to differ from the LinkedIn about section because LinkedIn about can be a bit more creative and use I use a lot of different ways to tell a story or tell a narrative, but that executive summary or that sneak peek of, you know, who's in this resume that you're going to be passing your eyes over is going to be just a couple, you know, two or three sentences. But, you know, this is another section where you would want to, you know, get some feedback on it. Like always, always, always have somebody read your resume, especially somebody who's in the field or, you know, as close as possible to the position or the, the area that you're interested in. And also just look through people that you know who are working in these types of positions already and see what language they use. And if it's something that's adaptable to yourself or something that sounds authentic to you, you know, it doesn't have to be full of buzzwords and it doesn't have to say, you know, I'm uh, like excellent communicator, multitasker, able to, you know, you don't have to tell people those types of traits about yourself because so many reviewers have heard them all before and it it just sounds like boilerplate but use some of your skills of genre analysis by looking through many profiles on LinkedIn and seeing what other people say and that's going to give you a sense of how it's written and how you can adapt it to be authentic to yourself um, the last question that I can see here is, um, how do you strike a balance between your actions in a role while acknowledging you may have worked as part of a team? Such a great question. Typically, teams figure out or have delegated or, you know, it, it works out that people within it have their own expertise that they execute on and their own you know, contributions to those deliverables. So try to figure out what your role was within the team and own that role. And, you know, maybe you were in charge of creating graphic design for a conference event and you had to create all of the marketing collateral and advertising for that conference. You know, maybe that was your role on the team rather than logistics or catering or, or rentals or vendors. So, so isolate as much as you can your own role. You can acknowledge that you were working as part of a team, you're part of conference organization team, 
uh, developed marketing co collateral and advertising for the conference, you know, whatever else your role was. So you can differentiate what you added to it. And I want to thank everybody so much for sticking with me and these wonderful questions. I'm going to read all of these questions in the chat and I'll look at this feedback and respond to you by email or, or somehow through the course of our conference. And we'll also incorporate any unanswered questions, I hope, into our later career management sessions. So thank, I appreciate you so much. Thank you.